our lives for the glory of your name. And we'll give you thanks for it in Christ's name. And everybody said amen. 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 Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Now we're, we're talking about this moving forward. And we, we kind of began with a little introduction. And then we talked about context last week. That the context of life is always changing. And uh, th that was so good. The staff and I talked about it again this week. Just how in 42 years how much Greer has changed. And what it would, you know, the context of 42 years ago is different. And here's what I'm noticing. It's changing faster. Now, I don't know if that's me getting old. But, 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 but the change seems to be happening so much faster. And then we had a great discussion about going into the, con the context of ministering in a small church versus ministering in a large church. And I'm going to tell you, those are two totally different beasts. In the small church, everybody knows everybody. And everybody knows <laughs> they know everything about everybody. That's not always healthy. We know that we have people who come here because they can be anonymous. I know that they sit in the balcony. <laughs> and they can be anonymous. And, and I meet people all the time. Oh, I've been going to your church for four years. And I'm just, oh, okay, you sit in the balcony. You see me up there? No, but if you've been coming that long and I don't know you, chances are. So, so the small church versus, it's, it's different. You know, you're in a small church, and you know you have, and, and it gets out that you've got something going on in your life, maybe a health challenge. Well, you come to the altar, the whole church swarms around you because they all know. You come to a large church, and unless you're really plugged in somewhere, you can have the same health challenge, come forward for prayer, and nobody comes stand with you because nobody knows. It's the difference between ministering to small and large. And if, if, if it looks easy, it ain't. So context is an interesting discussion. Tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about what I call these are complicated times. But don't get stuck in them. Amen. Daniel chapter 3 verse 8. But <clears throat> some of the astrologers, should be on your screen, went to the king and, and I'll just pause. Most of you know what's happened here. Nebuchadnezzar has built this giant statue honoring himself. He would have been a good president. And... <laughs> He's built this statue honoring him. Probably would have been a good pastor too. Been a good uh, pastor. Uh, anyway, honoring himself. And he said, when you hear the sound of all the music, everybody bow down uh, and, and, and honor and worship the statue. And everybody did except for three stubborn little Hebrew boys. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Well, here's what happened. There's always somebody watching. You know, when you bow your head for prayer... Somebody's watching to see if you close your eyes. There's always somebody watching. So verse 8, but some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all of the people to bow down and worship the gold statue. When they hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, I don't know what that is, the lyre, the harps, the pipes, and other musical instruments. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Not, not just some Jews, king. We know who they are. See, these, these astrologers, they'd have been good church members. Y'all didn't even get that. But there are some Jews who you have put in charge of the province of Babylon and they pay no attention to you. They refuse to serve your gods, and they do not worship the gold statue you set up. So Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage, ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve the gods or to worship the gold statue I've set up? And let me pause right here. Now remember, he is the king who has promoted these guys. 
in the high position. So he feels like they owe him something. But he likes them. You can almost hear in the Hebrew it says, tell you what I'm going to do. I'll give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue that I've made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace and then what God will be able to rescue you from my power. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. Here's the point. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty. Notice the respect they still have, because we're going to talk about that tonight. Your majesty, we will make it clear that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Now, quick story about this passage for me, and, and it really leads into our, our, our session tonight. The first time I ever heard Andy Stanley preach, this was the text he preached from. Now, if you don't like Andy Stanley, don't turn me off. I'm just telling you a story. Um, his father, Charles, was the pastor of First Baptist Atlanta when it was downtown Atlanta, just beyond the varsity. And, uh, and quite honestly, I listened to Dr. Stanley every week. I found out in the early 80s when I left my father's church that everybody in our denomination didn't preach like my daddy. And this is back before the internet and YouTube and all that stuff. So the weekend Bo was born, we were in the hospital after he was born, and on a Sunday morning I was sitting in the hospital holding him, flipping through, see if he was on TV, and there was Charles Stanley preaching. And I, I listened to him and I thought, you know, for a Baptist, this guy's pretty good. And, uh, of course, then over time, I, I actually uh, learned that he grew up in Pentecost before he became a Baptist minister. And I actually got to meet him. Now, it was in the men's room of a restaurant. <laughs> uh, a restaurant in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was washing my hands, and I looked up, and there he stood behind me. I, I thought, is this a vision? Is this, uh... And so uh, and, and it, it, was a, it was a good moment, and I enjoyed talking to him. But... I would record Dr. Stanley every week in the old VCR, program your VCR, pray the power doesn't go off because you have to reset everything. And I would program the VCR to record Dr. Stanley every week. And sometime during the week, I would watch him because I enjoyed hearing him expound the scripture. He was very good. I don't agree with all his theology. He didn't agree with all of mine. But that don't mean he didn't expound the scripture well. And so one of those tapes, all of a sudden, this young guy steps up to the pulpit, and it's Andy, his son, who was then the youth pastor at First Baptist Atlanta. And this was the text he used. And he used an analogy that has stuck with me, and that's probably been 35 years. He used, and I think it stuck with me because I could associate with it. He talked about when he went into the seventh grade. How many of you remember the seventh grade? Some of y'all really remember it. You were there a couple years, but. <laughs> back, in the, back in the seventh or eighth grade, you had what was called health class. Does everybody remember that? Now, this is back before health class got perverted. You had health class. And in health class, they taught you, like, a balanced diet. You know, meat. Uh, milk, bread, fruit. That's where I discovered one slice of pizza covers all of the meal groups. <laughs> you got meat, you got bread, you got cheese, you got dairy. If you want fruit, on, you know. So you, you had health class. And they also did, they would bring in films to show you to try to help you make decisions about life. So Andy tells this story that he comes in and it's health class. And they show this film, and in the film, there's a bunch of young people at a party. 
Uh, interestingly enough, all the films start with young people at a party, teenagers at a party, and somebody has drugs, somebody has a little marijuana, and then somebody else has something else, and they're passing the drugs around. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, <laughs> see, I'll tell you the difference between generations. I started to say LED. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what the screen is. <laughs> How about LSD? <laughs> and so, you know, they got this film, and these kids start tripping, and they're, they're hallucinating, and they're going out of their mind, and then one of them overdoses in the film. And they show this horrific death, this horrific overdose, and he said, that day, me and all of my classmates swore we would never take drugs. We, we would never, ever experiment with drugs. And he went on to say, but the reality is, within a couple of weeks, classmates were doing drugs. He said, they, they show us another film, and it's at a party, and it's teenagers. And, and some of you have teenagers, you're never going to let your kids go to a party again when I'm done. <laughs> And the boys decide, let's go get in the car and have some fun. One of the guys has a car. And you all remember that, when one of your buddies had a car. And they get in the car, and it's at night, and he's going to show them just how fast he can drive the car. I know none of you ever did that. And he's going down the road, and he opens the car up, and he says, watch this, and he turns the lights out. And then all of a sudden, there's a collision, and the boys in the car are all dead. And he said, that day, all of us in that class swore we would never ride in a car again. <laughs> we would certainly never ride with somebody who didn't know how to drive. But, but, but he went, and he went on to say, but a lot of us came out to get in parents' car, and we were like, no, we're good. We're walking home today. We don't. And then the last one, the last one was there was a party and a uh, bunch of kids there and somebody had alcohol. And they began to pass the alcohol around and things got crazy and somebody got drunk and went up on the roof and thought they could walk across the roof and you know what happened. And in the film, there they are laying in the yard and everybody's crying and and all, he said, me and all of my classmates swore we would never drink. For the rest of our lives, we swore we'd never drink. And then he went on to say this. But the reality was, within a few weeks, there were classmates doing drugs, driving recklessly, and drinking. And that would be the story for the rest of, he said, for my school life. People who swore they'd never do it. And here was his statement. I'll never forget it. He said, we had preferences, but we didn't have conviction. That's a great analogy. We have preferences, but we didn't have conviction. It's January the 17th. 17 days ago, a lot of us had preferences. What we were going to eat and what we weren't going to eat, of how we were going to exercise. And, but 17 days later, we've realized there's a difference between a preference and a conviction. We live in complicated times. And, and I think the world is more complicated than it's ever been. And I think society is more complicated and the culture is more complicated. And, and our conclusion in staff meeting as we talked about Churches Monday was pastoring is more complicated than it's, than it's ever been. The church today exists in complication. I posted a little article on the, on the Facebook page yesterday that just talked about everything the church faces and just how complicated the time is. 
if we are going to individually and institutionally continue to move forward with God, here's the challenge. We have to identify what we really believe. Core values. And you have to identify what are your core values. Another way might be, what are your non-negotiables? Now, that's so important because you live in a world that wants to negotiate everything. What are your non-negotiables? You've got to learn to hold to your non-negotiables because you're going to get pressure from every direction. But you've also got to learn not to become antagonistic in sharing your core values. I see I lost all of the church people right there. Thank you so much. So let's talk about all of this. Core values. Here's the first statement I'll give you about core values. It's, 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 it's this. It's while we should always consider context, we must resolve that our core values do not waver and are not for sale. Do we live in a different world? Absolutely. You know, are our kids and grandkids facing things in school that we never fathomed facing? Absolutely. The world has changed. The culture has changed. Everything around us has changed. Work has changed. Entertainment has changed. Everything around us is shifting and moving fast. And the context is always changing. But we have to resolve individually and as church people and as a church that our core values do not change regardless of the changes of context and our core values are not for sale. In the Old Testament, there was this man named Naboth. And Naboth owned a vineyard. It had been passed down to him. It was part of his ancestry. That's how God designed the people of Israel. The land was passed down in the family, stayed in the family. If it ever got out of the family at the year of Jubilee, it was supposed to revert back to the family. That was the way God designed it all. He owned this one little vineyard. It wasn't anything wonderful, but it was his. Where it was, was adjacent to some property the king owned, Ahaz. And Ahaz wanted that vineyard. It is a great story. And Ahaz's wife, known as Jezebel, everybody say that, it just feels good coming off your lips. Jezebel, that Jezebel. If you've been in church long enough, you've heard that. She told her husband, you're the king. Don't let that little man push you around. Go down there and take the vineyard. Well, the man just absolutely, here's what he basically said to the king. It's not for sale. You can't offer me enough money. You can't offer me another vineyard. This is the vineyard that was given to me as my ancestry. And it's just not for sale. Now, in the end, just so you have closure to that story, he was stoned and killed. (laughs) They, they, they hatched a plot where somebody lied about him, found him guilty, stoned him and killed him, and the king took the, king took the vineyard, but, but God saw it. But here's the thing to Naboth. He wouldn't sell out his core values, even under pressure of the king. And so what we have to understand is one of the things we need to do as we move forward is we've got to define those core values and... And we've got to implant those in our children and say, this is not for sale. This is not negotiable. I might as well preach. I do worry about this parenting generation. Because I'm not sure sometimes who's in charge. 
And I'm telling my age now. I'm, sometimes I'm not sure. Sometimes I can be at the store and I'm not really sure who's in charge here. And, and we could really push this further. Do you know who advertisers go after? Children. They know something. They know who's making the decisions. I did not grow up in that era. You know, I grew up in the era of I could be obedient or I could be sore. It was my choice. Amen. Can I get an amen? I can, you know. And, and I grew up in an era where there were no negotiations. If I wanted negotiating, I had to get mother to go negotiate with daddy. And I don't even want to know what those conversations were. But anyway, you have to define your core values. And we'll talk about some of those in a minute. And you have to, uh, you have to realize those things are not for sale. But I put a note at the bottom. Because it's so important. Everything is not a core value. Because we are church people, <clears throat> and it's easy for us to become rigid. And in our rigidity, take things that really aren't core values, but defend them as if the whole world depends on it. Amen. If you try to establish everything as a core value, you do become rigid. You become that person nobody can tolerate. Nobody wants to be around very long. And the reality is this. Andy Stanley said, we, we didn't have conviction. We just had preferences. Well, some things are just preference. Some things are just preference. Whether or not you come to the 9 o'clock service or the 1030 service, it's just preference. Uh, you know, the 9 o'clock service isn't going to get in heaven before the 1030 does because they like to come early. <laughs> it won't be two lines when you get there, 9 o'clock, 10, you know, early service. Like, it's just preference. And preferences demand flexibility. On core values, not for sale. But preferences, flexibility. Let's discuss. 9 o'clock, 10.30. Do you like pew seats or do you like the individual theater seat? I'm not asking you, but recliners. There you go. He did recliners. That's what I got Sunday morning. Sunday morning I got that. So if we could do it, he did recliners. This would really be great. I can't keep you awake now. Do you want the pastor to wear a robe? When he preaches? Or do you want him to wear a suit or a sport coat? I had a lady several years ago. I performed a wedding for a beautiful couple in our church, Steve and Amy Ward. And, and, and they wanted me to wear a robe for the wedding. Y'all remember that? And uh, I wore the robe. I thought it was great. I can just have a T-shirt on underneath, you know. <laughs> I'm going to be comfortable. And they wanted me to wear a robe. So I wore the robe and I went to the reception and one of the good members met me at the reception. And said, Preacher, I'm just going to tell you right now. If you wear a robe to preach in on Sunday, I'm going to leave this church. <laughs> to which I said, don't you tempt me. Because <laughs> it's still back there. I mean, <laughs> it's a preference. But what, Preacher, why would you put that out here to us? Because we are church people. And we will fight over anything. And if a preacher wore a robe one Sunday, there would be people who would have a cow. <laughs> Core value, not for sale. Preferences, flexible. I think it was Augustine who said this. In the essentials, there must be unity. In the non-essentials, there should be liberty. And in everything, there should be charity. In the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. What are core values? What are, what are some good ones? To have. I, I knew you were going to ask me that, so let me give you some. 
um, that the Bible is the inerrant, in inspired Word of God with all authority for governing life. Amen. Now, that's not for sale. Amen. That's non-negotiable. Uh, years ago when I had a real job, I would exercise at lunch. The hospital built the Life Center and I would go at lunch and do my exercise and I would get on a Stairmaster and it worked out great for me because I could read my Bible. And I would carry my Bible and I would read it and I did this for years. I, that was my, I was exercising and reading my Bible. And uh, so one day this girl who worked there, her name's Debbie, and she was a nice, not nice little young girl. You know, young people know everything. She was a nice little young girl. She came up to me and, and she said, uh, asked me about the Bible, where I went to church, and, and I asked her where she went to church. And she said, you know, we believe the Bible. We just don't think all of it is, is applicable today. And so I handed her my Bible. I probably shouldn't have. And, and I said, would you go home and cut out what isn't real so I'll, I'll, I'll know the difference? She didn't appreciate that very much and <laughs> didn't, didn't talk to me a lot more. But my point was this. Once you start cutting, where are you going to stop? And you're going to cut out this and somebody else is going to cut out that. This is a core value. This is not for sale. Amen. The Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God and the authority for our lives. Amen. Core value, the, trinity, the triune God. God exists eternally in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, explain that to me. I can't explain it to you, but He is. Amen. The virgin birth of Jesus Christ, that He is God incarnate that He was crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended to heaven where He sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and me. Non-negotiable. Non-negotiable. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. And that repentance is demanded according to Scripture. Non-negotiable. That in Christ there's repentance and justification and new birth through the blood of Jesus that the Holy Spirit has been given unto all all of those are non-negotiables for me. But there are some things, if I, and, and I got those from our Declaration of Faith, but there are some things that I wouldn't define them as non-negotiables. Now I'm going to get everybody. You think this is bad. Why do you listen to Monday's podcast? Um, our church believes, and I believe, I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. I believe that. But there are people in our church who believe in a mid-tribulation rapture of the church. They believe there'll be a rapture, but they believe the church will see some part of the tribulation. And there are some who believe in a post Tribulation. And all three can bring their Scripture references because there's not anything in Scripture that says, hey, it will be a pre-tribulation rapture. Matter of fact, the word rapture is not even in Scripture. It's not there. In the essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. So if you decide, as you read the Bible that you believe that the church will see some degree of suffering, but okay, I'm not going to fall out with you because of that. You interpret it one way, I interpret it another way. We're both going, I'm just going to get there before you do. <laughs> you want to stick around here for a while? Have at it! You know, hey, go to my house. It should be empty. Stay there. <laughs> but watch out for that junk drawer. It'll get you every time you open it. You know. What the Bible has clearly spoken on has to be held as a core value. It has clearly spoken on the preciousness of life. So abortion is a non-negotiable for me. It has clearly spoken the truth about human sexuality. So any, any version, and probably the better way to say that is any perversion 
beyond what the Bible says is a non-negotiable for me. And what well, uh, preacher, you're being a little, you're regimented, and then you're not regimented. You're, you know, yeah, that's the whole idea. But, but here's the focal point. On essential core values, you can't let yourself drift into the murky middle because that's where people drown. You can't, on core values, you can't say, I'm going to get in the middle of the road because that's where you drown. This is one of the things that, that, uh, that is a challenge for higher education Christian institutions like the one I do some work with, to try to convince them you can't be in the middle. And really to try to convince them people don't want you in the middle. They want you to clearly say what you believe. And when you say that, those who believe with you will be with you. And those who don't, won't. But you're a whole lot better off saying this is what I believe and I hold to those beliefs than to try to be in the middle. Let me tell you the perfect recipe for you to have a nervous breakdown. You ready? Make everybody happy. That's it. That's all, all it takes. I can, I can bring that down further. The, the perfect recipe for, for your next family gathering to be a success is for you to do whatever it takes for everybody to be happy. Now, when, when you go into the hospital, be sure to tell them to call us because they won't let us in those places without a code to get in. Because you will certainly lose your mind Amen. trying to make everybody happy. It doesn't happen. It can't. You can't get in to the murky middle. You have to know what you believe. You have to be clear about what you believe. You have to, oh, here we go. You have to live what you believe. Amen. Now, don't you preach it if you ain't living it. We got, we, we, we got enough of that. And you have to communicate what you believe in love. You have to communicate it in love. I don't think the Scripture calls us to form necessarily opinions on everything. Well... Preacher, I heard you might do a makeover. I'm going to tell you right now, if you get a carpet I don't like, don't tell me that. I'll get 5,000 different squares to make sure you're mad. We don't have to form opinions on everything, but you ought to have your core values settled. And if you don't have your core values settled, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to spend most of your life marred in the middle of the road while everybody goes by. Because you're not going to know who you are, and the people around you aren't going to know who you are. Your children aren't going to know who you are. They'll come home, okay, which dad is here today? If those core values aren't marked, if they aren't defined, if they aren't communicated. Now, once those are settled, we have to remain vigilant. You, have, you, you can't just be committed to the value. You've got to be committed to owning it. Um, and this is the challenge. We all love Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And boy, we love that story. Because, you know... They stood up to the king. We don't have to defend ourselves before you in this matter. The God that we serve is able to deliver us. But guess what? Even if he doesn't, no compromise here, buddy. We're not going to bow. Guess what? The king was not impressed. Because when the music played again and they didn't bow, what did he do? Threw them in the fire. Threw them in the fire. I wonder how many of us, if that had been us, when a soldier picked us up to throw us in the fire, we'd have been yelling, wait a minute! <laughs> oh, you mean bow! I'm sorry! Yeah, language barrier. I'm from Israel. I don't speak Babylonian. How many of us said, wait a minute, this, this isn't the way the Disney movie went. 
See, the reality is they stood up for what they believed and they were thrown in the fire. They didn't burn. That was my next note. Were they delivered? Yes. But if you go to Hebrews chapter 11, everybody wasn't delivered. You go read the Faith Hall of Fame, and they'll talk about the men that were delivered, but they'll also talk about the ones that were sown into and that were burned and that were martyred. Not everybody was spared. And what I'm saying is you have to believe what you believe when everything's great, and you have to believe what you believe when everybody's against you. Amen. And there may come a point <laughs> where you come under attack. And if the Lord tarries, there will come points in this culture where you will be, and it's happening today, where you will be directly attacked because of what you believe. You know, uh, an argument's all fun. <laughs> it's all fun and games till somebody starts shooting. And then it all changes. Here's my third point tonight. Don't confuse conviction with antagonism. Core values are essential and we all need them. But nowhere do you have a license to go looking for people who don't share your values and start a fight with them. Amen. Amen. I, I mentioned that I, I do some walking. Uh, I, I don't know why it is, but um, I guess it's from those years that I, I, I was doing a little bit of jogging. It's hard for me to get my heart rate up just walking. It just doesn't go up. And uh, so I have to find places where there's hills and I have to walk the hills and so I, I found a little track well it's very common in that little track that I take that on certain days Jehovah's Witnesses are out <laughs> and, and they, they take they, they, they bring their little it, it looks like a it looks like a gospel music record case they bring their you've seen them downtown Greenville they, they have the little stand and, and now they stand there and don't say a word. I've never had one stop me. I've never had one offer me water, but I've never had one stop me. I've never had one say, can I talk to you? I've not, never had one say anything. They're just there with their material if I want to ask them. But here's the thing I don't do. I don't stop and provoke them knowing that their core values are different than mine. What would be fruitful of that? Now, if the Lord told me to, I, obviously I would. Um, but you, you have your core values, you, be, you, you believe them, but you don't go around picking fights with those who don't believe them. You never see Jesus going and picking a fight. Now, when they picked it, he defended himself, and he defended his disciples. But you never see him. When the attack came, he humbly stood for what was right. But to, to, to intentionally antagonize people that you know don't share what you believe, I'm going to tell you what that is. That is immaturity. You want to impact them? Who's listening? You want to impact them? Live it. Amen. And live it in the love of Christ. Amen. Because that's what sells it. I've never seen anybody argued into the kingdom of God. Amen. Got an, an attorney somewhere around here. I'm not supposed to point to him. You, you know, attorneys, attorneys love to argue oh, yeah. and win the argument. And church people love to argue. And they always win the argument because they'll never admit they lost. I've never seen anyone argued to the altar or into the kingdom of God. But I'll tell you what I have seen. I've seen people so drawn by the love of God that they witnessed in somebody's life that they looked at them and said, I don't necessarily know everything you believe, but I want what you have. Don't argue it. Live it. Live it. And live it with such love that, that 
it becomes something that they can't imagine living without. I'm going to land the plane. The nation, the church, the family needs individuals who firmly yet humbly hold to their core values. But do so in the love of Christ. Shadrach, in that passage, go back and look. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego never disrespected the king. Not one time. Now, let's pause. He was as wrong as wrong could be. What he did was a blatant abomination. He was as wrong as wrong could be. And I'm afraid some of us, we'd have got us a church posse. And, and you talk, it would have been on. Go read it. Shadrach, Meshach, they came in and they said, O king, live forever. They respected him. You'll never win anyone through antagonism. They respected him. There was never disrespectful. But here's what else they didn't do. In the heat of the moment, they didn't wilt. And they didn't back down. And they didn't have a meltdown. you got to define your core value. And when they are tested, and you listen to me, brothers and sisters, they are going to be tested. The world will test them to see if you really believe what you say you believe. The people around you will test you to see if you really believe what you say you believe. When those tests come, you have to be so committed that you don't wilt and you don't back down, but you also don't have a meltdown. You plan, you act, you talk, you live in accordance with those values you hold. And here's what will happen. The world will be amazed at what they see being lived right in front of their eyes. I want to tell you again, you can't preach that. You have to live that. You can't argue that. You have to live that. I I tell young pastors, uh, I don't know why they call me, I guess because I'm old, but anyway... I tell them all the time, you have to earn the right to be heard. The overseer can appoint you as pastor, but it's only by relationship that you get the right for the people to listen. You can stand up and preach and they can hear you, but until you've earned the right to be heard, they're not going to pay you any attention. What's true of the preacher is true of us. We have to earn the right to speak into people's lives. Not just by knowing the truth and not just by having the bumper sticker on our car. By living it in love every day. So Lord, help us to grasp the core values of your word. The undeniable truths on which we anchor our soul. Help us to have discernment to tell the difference between what is truly a core value and what is simply a preference. And let us live our values out, never drifting to the middle, but live them out in full compliance and full assurance that you will respect and honor our commitment. And as we live these out before men, Christ will be seen, heard, and glorified. Let the words of our mouths and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. God bless you. Wear your sweatshirt Sunday if you're so inclined. Don't stay, don't, and don't wear it at home. If you can put it on, come on in.